thank you everyone for joining a really exciting conversation. Uh, it's exciting for all of y'all to come and I'm really excited who we're gonna have a conversation with. Richard Russick, who I think for almost all of y'all uh, needs really no introduction, but I think uh, Richard, I'm probably boiling down your whole life into uh, too few bullet points for you. But uh, the things that that I, I remember about you is that you were, you, in 1989, you, you were the winner of the U.S. Math Olympiad, which is far further than I ever got in the math competition circuit. Not that I didn't try, but you're, you're a rock star in that world. Uh, and then, of course, the art of problem solving, which only continues to get more and more momentum and does incredible things. And we have overlap in that in between the two, you, you worked as a bond trader. And, and similarly, between my academic life and my Khan Academy life, I worked as a hedge fund analyst, which has analogs. Yeah. Uh, so, so welcome, Richard. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And I got to tell you, tell you a story I haven't told you before, I don't think, Sal, is uh, when you got started and you were really starting to take off with Khan Academy, I turned to Dave Patrick, who uh, this might have been, two, oh, this was 2009, 2010, something along pretty early on in, in, your, in your growth trajectory. And I'm like, hey, Dave, you know, should we be worried about this Khan Academy thing, you know, because maybe that's going to be big competition. And Dave said, no, we don't have to be worried about, about Sal succeeding. We have to be worried about him failing because he's carrying the banner for online education. So I want to thank you personally for not failing <laughs> and for carrying the banner for online education so well. No, and I, I have to double down what you just said. I think, you know, given your success in the competitive world and many competitive worlds in the past, and I, I you know, anyone who's played Monopoly or Risk with, would, with me would tell you that I, I sometimes can be a little bit competitive. Um, and, and I do, you know, there's part of me that wants to serve as many people as possible, but of course it feels good. If it's like, yeah, I want Khan Academy to, to be the, the, the place that generates the impact. Uh, you know, art of problem solving, I've never felt kind of a, a, a competition with because it's so complementary to what we're trying to do. And it's such a rich spectrum. I have my own kids. Uh, you know, we have the whole collection of art of problem solving books. We do problems together on it all the time. So I think these are very complementary efforts that we're doing. And I think both of us, you're absolutely right. We're, it's, 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 we're, we're, we're competing against ignorance. <laughs> we're competing against people not utilizing their brains, uh, which is, I think, what the, the end state we, we both want. You know, I, I want everyone, first of all, I'll make an announcement before I start asking Richard a few questions. Uh, there's a, a link, Akshay will post it in the chat, uh, where you can go to post questions. Uh, so you can start posting questions for either myself or Richard or both of us uh, right now. When you post your question, please put your first name. Uh, maybe you don't have to put your last name. We want to keep everyone uh, private, but put your first name. And then when we'll, we'll, you can vote up questions that you like. You can either add your own or you can vote up a question that you like. And then I'm going to, once we open it up to q and I'm going to go in order of the most upvoted questions. So when you see, if you see your question is near the top of it, uh, please raise your hand. That'll make it easy for Akshay and the moderators to unmute you when I call on you, because we'd love to hear the question from you uh, versus uh, me just reading it. Although I might do that if we hit some some technical difficulties. I'll also give the disclaimer because it's 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 easier to give it now than having to interrupt someone when they're asking a 10 minute long question. Uh, please do not ask 10 minute long questions. <laughs> we we want to make sure there's enough time for everybody. So you know if you could keep your question to ideally under under 20 or 30 seconds, uh, that will be much appreciated. Uh, but I, I will I will uh, take the privilege of starting asking Richard a few questions that I've always wanted to ask him. You know, Richard, when you when you were the winner of the U.S. Math Olympiad, I mean, what was your mindset going into this? Was this one of those things? I remember going to some of these math competitions when I was young and always feeling like, wow, like, am I going to be able to do well here? Did you have those feelings? Did you have feelings of insecurity? And then how did you kind of get through those? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, uh, when the first time I went to the Math Olympiad program, that's the training program for for what will eventually be the U.S. team. I was a sophomore um, from Northern Alabama. I didn't know anyone else who had ever gone to this. So I had figured that I was just the smartest person in the world. So then I get to the Math Olympia program and you're there for five weeks. You have a practice test every other day. It's three or four problems, three or four hours. So I'm there. I see probably 60 or 70 problems on practice tests and I got exactly none correct, not a single one. So I was definitely not the smartest person in the world. Um, so I go home the next year I practice, I practice, I work really hard. I had the stack of formula sheets and oh, I was so sure I, what I really need to do was no more math. I was going to learn more math like those other people knew. 
So my stack got bigger, got bigger. I knew all the formulas. I was going to show them what I could do. I got back to the training camp my junior year and I showed them what I could do. I still couldn't do any of the problems. Did not get a single problem the second year either. It was the third year when I went back and I took my stack and I went, took out the first sheet. And I'm like, why is this true? Why is this true? Why is this true? And realized I didn't know why. And it was that year, spending that year asking myself, why are these things true? That I think I first started really doing math and first started really thinking about the process of creating knowledge instead of just ingesting knowledge. And I think that was the transition that made me able to do some of these Olympiad problems. Certainly when I sat down for that test, I was terrified. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to get any, just like I usually don't get any. But that, that transition really paid off, that change of focus. And I think that's something that uh, we really bring out in when we're teaching is, is trying to help other students through that, through that shift. And just, to, I mean, I, I think you're probably underselling your sophomore and junior self. I mean, you got pretty far. I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I, I never got that far. <laughs> and, and I thought I was understanding. I mean, so you must have been understanding a lot of math intuitively. So, so what was kind of the difference? Yeah, I mean, I think part of it was I could, I could, t- the set of facts I knew I could apply to problems that were close to things I had already seen. It's just when it got a little bit farther away and I had to create tools that I would need to solve those problems. Mm-hmm. So it, it was that the, the competitions maybe before I got to say the Olympiad level, um, the tools that I had memorized, I could apply to enough of those problems to get through and I, I could get by. But then when you get to like proof mathematics, why is this true? It's a different mindset. You can't just throw everything you have at it and gut through a lot of the problems the way you can say the first few levels of competition. You have to have a deeper, a deeper understanding. And I didn't have that when I was, when I was uh, earlier, earlier on in my studies. And then what was that aha moment where you're like, not only am I starting to get these right, but you know, I, 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 I might be <laughs> kind of <laughs> shining I mean, now. I think, I mean, I think part of it was, it was probably college. It probably wasn't even there. Cause I mean, you, you know, you, you win a math comp, I mean, it feels good to win contests, but you don't know how many people are, are participating and there are always people who are better. And, you know, that's certainly something I learned at the math Olympiad program. Even when I was, w- was a winner on the Olympiad and alternate for the US team, there were still people that were way, way faster I was. Um, but you get to college and you see that these skills transfer. And I think that's part, it's probably part of why you started with mathematics when you were teaching is math is a great way to train people how to think, uh, how to approach problems. And then you can take that skill and transfer it to other things. So I found that my physics classes, chemistry, uh, computer science, philosophy, economics, all of these things, I could use the same general strategies to work through my college classes. So I had a huge advantage coming into college that a lot of students didn't have. And I didn't appreciate it until I got through that first and second year and saw a lot of my classmates struggling and then, you know, they were just as smart as I was. If they stayed with math and science, they were there by the time they finished college. But a lot of them stopped before they got there. And that, you know, they didn't quit school, but they quit studying the math or science that they went there to study because they didn't have the sort of training um, that I had earlier. Yeah, no, I, I, I've definitely seen parallels. Although, I mean, your, your training, I know you're, you're very humble when you talk about these other theoretical people who knew more, but you're, 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 you're pretty close to the top of that mountain, if not at, at it. You know, when you were young, and I actually want to open up, there's a lot of good questions coming in, uh, but I'm going to indulge myself and ask you a few more. <laughs> um, did you, you know, we have people, it, it looks like we have students who are in middle school, high school, maybe some college students or older are watching. And I know I had a lot of angst growing up, like, okay, I know there's certain things I liked. I liked math. I liked science. I actually liked art a lot. Uh, but what am I going to do with my life? How am I going to have an impact, make a dent in the universe, so to speak. What, what was your thought process like when you were in high school and college? What did you think you were going to become? Did you have angst over it? And how did that evolve? Yeah, so I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I studied chemical engineering in college. So, you know, this was, math was not even not even on the horizon then. I was always interested in education. The, the original art of problem solving books, that started in college. I started my senior year. My co-author, um, we were walking along the road and he's like, hey, we should write a book. Like, I've got 200 pages of notes. I don't know how to turn them into a book. And he said, I'll figure that out. And so we started writing books. And is that when you, did you start with education much earlier than when you started making videos for your family? Yeah, we, 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 now that we're talking, I mean, we've met before several times, but now that we're like going through each other, we've had strangely parallel lives. You grew up in Alabama. I grew up in Louisiana. 
both states not known for their, although they are stronger than most people expect. There was a very vibrant math competition environment in Louisiana. Uh, and maybe it was an, also an environment where I felt like I could shine, um, where, I, where I could shine more. Uh, but yeah, while I was in high school, you know, I definitely did not get to the same level of, of uh, where, where you got. But, you know, I used to, I was on the state math team and we went to Armel and math counts. And, and, you know, there was a thing with Mu Alpha Theta we used to do in the state. And so, so that, that I was, I was very active in that. And as part of that, I actually started tutoring a lot of friends and we used to do it as part of the, the math club, so to speak. And uh, that's when I started to realize what you also just described, which is a lot of folks fully capable of actually operating at a very high level. But, you know, I talk a lot about this at Khan Academy because they've accumulated gaps, especially in math or didn't understand the intuition, they, they struggle and they hit a wall at some point uh, and, and their self-esteem most of all just kind of goes away. So they give, they give up on themselves. So I was always interested in that. And I think like a lot of young people, I was like, like, you know, there's so many problems in the world that need fixing like poverty, like in inequity, you know, warfare, economic, you know, but when you peel the onion, it all boils down to education. And when you really peel even the education onion, it kind of is like critical thinking, um, uh, you know, uh, reading comprehension, things like that. My camera just shifted some, did some weird thing. I'll, I'll look into that. Uh, but but uh, so I've always been interested in that. And while I was in college, I kept gravitating towards jobs where I was, my first job in, in college for the financial aid, I, I was a reader for, um, of textbooks for kids who needed, uh, who needed, who had, who couldn't read because of maybe a visual impairment. Then I got a couple of internships um, working on software to help people learn. Um, and so I've always been fascinated by that. And so, yeah, that, but then one thing led to another, I went into tech, then I went into finance like you did, but that bug was always there. So I kept working on it. And it sounds like you were, it's kind of the same thing. Very much, very much. Yeah, I, I traded bonds for four years and it was you know, fun. I worked with some really amazing people, but um, yeah, I mean, you've been in the industry. Like if, if you want to actually be able to point at a thing you made uh, that's out there in the world, you know, you don't always get that feeling in a hedge fund, in a, in a trading firm. Now, if you're building the trading firm that's doing the thing, you know, the people who are building the company, I think have that sense of ownership. And I have some friends who are still in, in those sorts of positions. And I think they feel about their companies building it the same way I feel about building what, what we've built in education. But I certainly didn't feel that day to day on the desk. You know, I didn't go home saying, yes, I made the bond markets of Venezuela a little more efficient today. You know, it, it did, didn't give me the warm and fuzzies. So that was a big part of, of transitioning out of that to go find, find something to build. No, I used to have this very elaborate rationalization when I worked at the hedge fund, when people asked me like, well, what do you like, what do you do for society other than try to make money? And I was like, no, you know, pricing has a huge impact on how resources are allocated and the more efficient pricing is, the better resources get allocated. And on the margin, I was helping price discovery happen. Uh, but, you know, obviously it's a, it's a fairly uh, intellectual. It's true, but you don't feel it day to day unless you like really have their religion deeply. <laughs> no, and let's face it, it's a coin operated industry. Like people are there for the people are there for the money. It's intellectually challenging too. I mean, yeah. you know, but whether it's bond trading, I was at a, a long short hedge fund. They, they are intellectually challenge interesting in, in interesting work so if anyone wants to go into that i definitely encourage it and then you know become a donor of khan academy in the future <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you make your after your first billion yeah. um the, the, and, and and one last question and then i'll open it up uh, what 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 made you it sounded like you were working on these books the whole time that you were a bond trader what made you take the leap because you know a lot of people say sal if you stayed in the hedge fund industry you could have done really well and likewise i could imagine if you stayed a bond trader you could have done really, really well financially. What made you take the leap to go full-time into education? Well, I mean, before I was a bond trader, I was a high school teacher. I taught high school for one semester during which I learned that teaching high school is really hard. Um, it was, I was in way over my head. I was 22. I'm 49 now. So you can imagine what I looked like when I was 22. I looked younger than virtually all the kids. Yeah. You were like negative two. Yes. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was hard. And I felt like there was a set of kids I could speak to really well. And those were the kids who were a lot like me. Um, and then there was another set of kids that I struggled with because I was not ready to be the, the parent figure that they needed to try to draw them back into mathematics. And I, I feel like that's a, like something that Khan Academy, I think is critical for. I think you can, you, you've probably reached and pulled people back into an interest and in ability in mathematics um, that, that they lost somewhere along the way. 
So when I'm, I've got these two sets of students, one of whom I can really talk to well, another of whom I really am not sure that I can serve very well. So I leave teaching and go to something much easier, which was bond trading. In the intervening 10 years, um, along comes the internet. And I have the idea, hey, wait a second, we can put up a sign that says, we're gonna do challenging math. If you're looking for more than what you can find in the classroom, come here and we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do interesting problems. We're gonna do challenging problems. And that really was, was the transition was realizing, hey, wait a second, I can build something that allows, allows us to speak to the students that we know how to speak well and how to work well with and are people that we strongly believe are underserved and we believe are very, very important going forward. Because when there's COVID 2049, who's going to get us out of that mess? It's the kids that are in this room right now. Um, so, you know, the, this is an amazing group. And one of the questions I had for you was, uh, what's the most intimidating audience you've ever spoken to? Because I'm, I'm hoping our students are, are, <laughs> are close. Well, no, well, I think in terms of capability, this, 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 this audience is as good as any. Although I feel, to your point, very comfortable in this audience because it's a bunch of mini me and you's, probably better version, <laughs> kind of the 2.0 version <laughs> of, of me and you. So, but this, this is, I feel very comfortable um, in, in this audience right over here. I would say the most um, intimidating audience that I've ever spoken at. You know, I remember, let, let me, let me, I, I've actually spoken to the, uh, Separately, I spoke at the House Republican Caucus and the House Democratic Caucus. So this is all of the, our, our entire Congress I've presented to. And that, that was an interesting experience. Um, you, do, you don't know how people would, you know, and I keep my, my own politics very close. So yeah. people might be able to guess one way or the other, but I don't, I don't validate that. Um, that um, yeah, there's been a couple of other audiences where there's, you know, there's some childhood heroes in the audience or, you know, I'm like, hey, wait, that's George Lucas. <laughs> you know, or, like, I better not mess this up. Um, so, so those, those were, those were, what about yours? I'm, I'm curious. Oh, intimidating audiences. Uh, part of it, I mean, probably talking to, talking to large groups of students, talking to the Olympiad winners, like, oh, we're not going to talk math because they're so far ahead of me um, by now. I haven't been on as many, many large stages as you have, but uh yeah, I think that's that's part of it. I mean, part of it, like when I'm talking with when I, I've gone to the Olympiad ceremony a few times and talked with those students, um, and just you know, you're you're talking with people, and this is this room as well, that are going to have such an outside it outsize impact on the world going forward. And you you, know, you just really kind of you you hope so many good things for them, and you you hope you can kind of inspire them to use use their their abilities because the the abilities some of these kids have. Um, they can have a tremendous impact on the world the way like when you and I were kids, we didn't imagine what we could do, right? Like we didn't see the internet coming. We didn't know that this technology was going to be there to allow us to project what we can do all over the world in ways, you know, never before possible. These kids, these kids know it growing up and, and you want them to go out there and, and go after some of these really hard problems. And I'm starting to see it. And you, you're probably starting to see it as well. The, the kids who are, there are more students coming out of college looking for hard problems um, rather than looking for lucrative problems. And that's, that's been an inspiring thing to see over the last five or 10 years. 100%, 100%. Well, let me, let me start, let's start opening it up to the question. So the first, the highest rate uh, question is from Drew. Um, actually, if we can unmute Drew so Drew can ask his question. All right, I'm muting Drew. Hi, can you hear me? Um, yeah, I just had a question for both of you of if you have a favorite math problem. You, you have one off the top of your head? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll stretch the question a little bit. Um, I'm trying to think if I have a favorite explicit question. I, I do have some favorite ideas or proofs in math. Um, it, one of mine is the, you know, the justification that why e to the i pi uh, is equal to negative one. Um, I, I find that incredibly, it still gives me chills. Uh, and it might be pedestrian for Richard, but you know, every I'm like, wait, E is coming from continuous compound interest and or E to the X, the derivative of it is E to the X. Okay, that's cool. Um, I is this thing that, you know, fundamentally engineers invented to be able to have, more, you know, to start understanding control systems and things like that. You know, let's just say the square root of negative one has a value or let's call it on, you know, I, uh, pi, obviously everyone knows ratio of circumference diameter of circle. And that these things that come from like seemingly random parts of the universe 
connect. There's a justification why they connect in this beautiful way, which you can do using, you know, Taylor expansions and, and calculus. Um, and, and, it, and it connects into a very, you know, it's not like e to the i pi is equal to negative 4.28. It's <laughs> equals negative one or that e to the pi i pi plus one is equal to zero that it connects these fundamental numbers. You know, if we ever have to prove to aliens that we're smart, I think we have to somehow encode that into binary and send it their way. I don't know, Richard. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's where you'd start communicating with them. Um, actually, I, my favorite teaching problem is, is just the handshake problem. It's a problem all the kids know. We can't, we can't do handshakes anymore, so maybe it's, I don't know, it's an elbow bump problem. But just this, this idea that you can take uh, this, how many handshakes do you have in a group of eight people? And you, you start from there and you get, you know, most students start with one plus two plus three up, up through seven. And you get them to go from there to, okay, eight times seven divided by two. And then you get them to, oh, you've just learned how to sum the first natural numbers and turn that into just multiplying two adjacent numbers and divide by two. Uh, you've proven something algebraic with a counting concept and you walk, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes do this with fourth or fifth or sixth graders and you walk them through that and you can just see the light bulbs going off like one, one after another, one after another. And now you can take these two very unrelated seeming areas of mathematics and use one of them to prove something about the other one. So I think it's very similar to what you're talking about. You take these very unrelated pieces and you put them all together and it somehow all just fits. But yeah, that's, I think that's my favorite problem because of when you're teaching it for the first time to a student, um, just seeing it, seeing them light up and realize there's a whole new area of math in discrete mathematics that there's like, oh, there's probably more cool stuff there. And you haven't even shown them Pascal's triangle yet. Yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. No, that's a good one. Actually, when you say that, I mean, we could probably keep listing. It makes me think of like Monty Hall. The Monty Hall problem is a really fun one that, you know, even, even quite educated adults will get into screaming matches about it, like disagreeing with the math. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so that's, that's another, another fun, but obviously even, even my, my six-year-old can engage with the Monty Hall problem. So, so that's, a, that's another fascinating one. Uh, so let's see the next question, Jason, if you could uh, raise your hand and then if Akshay, one of the moderators can unmute you. Oh, yes. Hey, Sal. Hey, Richard. And so my question to you is, how can we integrate what Khan Academy and AOPS do, uh, does together to create this kind of like combo that can work to improve how uh, all students learn math? Well, we were just talking about that <laughs> um, before, before we started the show here. We were talking about ways to um, integrate art of problem solving with with Schoolhouse, which is the new venture that's kind of brought us brought us together. And actually, I'm going to turn the floor over to Sal for a minute to talk about Schoolhouse, and then we'll come back to to putting these two together. Yeah, well, well, first of all, thanks so much for that question, Jason. And yeah, Richard is actually right that this is exactly what we 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 got on the Zoom like 30 minutes early to to brainstorm some of these ideas because we, we've always had this. Uh, kind of mutual respect for each other. And as we saw, talked about earlier, we always thought it was incredibly complementary in what Khan Academy does and what Art of Problem Solving does. I think there's a couple of areas that we, we would love to see collaboration with both the orgs and frankly, with both with the communities. Uh, one area is we want all of y'all to seriously think about uh, leveraging the schoolhouse.world platform. One, to give back to other people, because I I'm guessing almost all of y'all are either already, already amazing tutors or could develop into being a really amazing tutors of other people and you'll feel really good about that. Uh, but also ways that you, can, that, that you can leverage Schoolhouse and create context so that it is a place to collaborate on you know, and meet other people who wanna work on uh, hard problems uh, together. Uh, you know, this is something that I think both Richard and I would have killed for, not, not really, but you know, that we would have died <laughs> for, uh, you know, for, uh, 40, 30 years ago, we're not that old, you know, well, maybe 40 years ago too. Um, but I'm a little younger, I'm, I'm 44, so I have to. Um, but, but uh, and so, you know, Akshay, who's on the Schoolhouse team, uh, one of our founding engineers, he is an art of problem solving alum. And he actually, he's the one that said, hey, we gotta do stuff, we gotta do stuff together. You know, there's already a section on Schoolhouse of even more math. There's, so there's taxonomies on most of kind of the standard middle school and high school and early college subject areas, but there's an area of even more math. We're thinking about if y'all wanna start creating sessions there um, and learning from sessions there, we, you know, working with Akshay and others, we could create art of problem solving specific or competition math specific taxonomies. We've been thinking about even in the core taxonomy of let's say algebra, there could be a, a, a a basic intro level uh, on Schoolhouse. There could be an intermediate level and Khan Academy can service 
as a the backbone for some of that. Uh, but then there could be an art of problem solving level or a advanced level uh, where you can go to deeper problems around systems of equations or you know really deep you know proofs or problems around quadratics or whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, we're even, I mean, I would love to, on the message boards, if y'all want to write, you know, Akshay was even thinking about creating leaderboards on, uh, how, you know, being able to see how much the art of problem solving community is contributing to other people's learning or how much you as an individual tutor can contribute to other people's learning as well. So I would love uh, any feedback there. I don't know, uh, Richard, any other thoughts yeah, there? Yeah, I think you captured a lot of it there. You, we, you talked earlier about the complementary nature of Khan Academy and AOPS, and I think that's exactly right, is... And that, that was evidenced by when we made the announcement that we were going to have this session today is seeing the number of kids posting on Art of Problem Solving that, you know, they have spent so much time in both spaces, you know, that they, they found so much in both places and that we can find more ways to, to make that happen. So uh, we, we see on our site, the kids create sessions for each other all the time. They're trying to teach they're trying to create, um, you know, they create separate and sometimes they're getting together on, on other chat services or something to run little classes or now on video. Schoolhouse gives them a very nice platform to do that. So our kids, they, they, they do enjoy, they do, they do enjoy teaching, um, it helps them with their community service for schools, but it also helps them learn. And that's probably a common experience you had as, as a student. Like for me, uh, one of the tricks I, I had in college was I was terrible at keeping taking notes. So I would make deals with my friends that if I could borrow their notes, I would tutor them. <laughs> and Man, we live like parallel lives. I, like, <laughs> that's exactly what I did. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's a great strategy. It's a great strategy, but you learn so much when you're teaching, right? That is just, um, you know, when I started with, with art of problem solving, um, teaching some of the Olympiad level classes, oh my goodness, to keep up with the students, you have to learn a lot of math. And you have to have an assistant who knows even more math so you can hand kids off when they get too far ahead of you. Uh, that, that works well too. So yeah, I think there, there are gonna be some ripe areas for us to collaborate and to, to be able to give students in art of problem solving um, a, a place where they can go and share, share their love of math, whether it's contest math or, or helping struggling students in various, in, in their schools or in other schools. Uh, I think it's a great way for them to give back to the community and also to help help them more deeply understand and appreciate all the math that they've learned. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this this teaching as a, a vector to learn. I remember in uh, in, in in college there was a, a brief time that I thought I was pre med, mainly because of parental pressure, and um, I decided I need to take the MCAT. And so I called up uh, actually Princeton Review, and I'm like, "How much does your prep course?" You know, and it was like way more than I could afford at the time. It was many thousands of dollars. And then I called up again. I was like, how much do you pay to teach the course? <laughs> and then they told me, I was like, that sounds good. And then I was like, oh, how do I apply? They're like, well, what's your MCAT score? I was like, well, I haven't taken it yet. And they're like, wait, well, I don't know. I was like, hold on a second. I, I think I know a lot of math, physics and or chemistry and biology. And they're like, okay. And they gave me, but, but yeah, by teaching it that summer, um, four hours a day, <laughs> <laughs> I knew that stuff cold yeah. uh, by, 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 by the end of the, the summer. So 100% agree with that. So let's see. You stayed with pre-med longer than I did. I went through two weeks of a bio class in college and I'm like, no, I loved organic chemistry, but the bio class was not for me. Um, yeah. Well, well, there's a whole, we could go on a whole other tangent there. <laughs> um, so the next question comes from Anonymous, which I'm assuming is not their name, uh, or it would be a bad joke on behalf of their parents if it was. Um, but the question, I'll just ask it because we don't know who Anonymous is. Uh, what is the hardest math problem you've ever come across? I'll let you tackle that one. Oh, I, I vividly remember it, uh, coming back from, uh, it, it was during my junior year, because it would have been after mop. Um, I got this problem that I worked on. I worked on for two or three hours. And a lot of the students here know it. It's the Colatz conjecture, conjecture, but I didn't know that. You start with any positive integer. If it's even, you take half. If it's odd, you triple it and add one. And you just keep going. So you start with five, uh, triple it, add one, you get 16, then you take half, you get eight, you take half, you get four, then you get two, then you get one, triple that, add one, you're back to four, two, one, four, two, one, four, two, goes in a loop. So I spend three, four hours trying to solve this problem. And finally I call what call, you know, because that's what you did back in 19. 87. You <laughs> didn't write an email. I called Sam Vanderveld, who a uh, very good friend of mine, head of proof school. And one of the people who taught me that I wasn't going to be a mathematician because he clearly was. I call him up and I'm like, Sam, how do you do this problem? And he just starts howling, laughing at me because I have just spent three or four hours on this 
still unsolved problem in mathematics. So uh, that I'm sure I've come, well, I haven't obviously come across harder math problems because no one solved that one. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll throw, you know, the one I gave a brief attempt in college. I mean, everyone who's taking PA, uh, computer science knows, uh, you know, there, there are certain problems that can be solved in polynomial time. Uh, and then there's, you know, NP, which is not polynomial time, which is kind of cryptography and everything is based on things like factoring, uh, pri you know, uh, prime factorization and things like that. Um, there, there was a, about a week where I said, maybe I can <laughs> be the person that collapses P equals NP. Obviously, I did not succeed. Um, I, I suspect you've probably had a bigger impact with what you've done than had you solved that problem. So maybe, maybe it's I, a I good think, thing well, you well, the, the, the irony is that if you solve that problem, you actually cause mass chaos. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, it's, it actually might not, act, most problems will be constructive Fair. for the world, but if you solve that problem, like all of a sudden all of cryptography <laughs> and data security like falls apart. Yes. Um, yes. But, but, it, but, you know, it'd be cool. <laughs> 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 All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, next question, Pranav. If you wanna, um, we we raise. If you don't, and then uh, we can unmute you. Pranav. Yeah. So, uh, how do you recommend that we get started on lofty goals, like uh, going from a field AMC ten to the USA Math Olympiad qualification? Richard, especially with that, with that. I mean, Pranav, do you want to know specifically in kind of the math competition world or just life? Isn't the answer the same? <laughs> Maybe. Okay, so I'll let you take it because you you have more expert. I don't know. I, I I have no cred in how to actually get to the U.S. Math Olympiad. Well, I mean, it's, it's so I, I I read this book, oh, um, Mark Bowden's Guest of the Ayatollah, and and it's about when uh, the hostage crisis in Iran, um, about the failed effort to um, to extricate them. So you know the Marines fly in, they land the planes in the desert somewhere. And then they fly out, they, they, they bail. At one point during this, uh, the, the planes are sitting on the ground, they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting to try to leave. And the Marines who are now not going to do anything, they just go to sleep. And the planes are starting to roll around, they're starting to roll around. One of them bumps another one and one of them catches on fire. And it's on fire, all the Marines get up and they're running, they're jumping out. One of the men wakes up and he runs and he just, runs out the window, jumps out the window, throws out his arms because he believes he's in the air because that's what the planes are supposed to be doing and you know, falls about six feet, slam, hits the ground really hard, gets up, runs off. And the guys are like, you know, what are you doing? You were jumping out of the plane without a parachute. And he's like, the plane was on fire, one problem at a time. And that is how you go after the lofty goals. One problem at a time, one problem at a time. Start closer, start, deal with the problem that's right in front of you. Pick a problem that's right in front of you that's in the direction of your goal, like the guy who's trying to get out of the plane, uh, and take care of that problem first. But if you are going to jump out of a plane, do wear do wear a parachute. I love that about you know. Um, I never thought the lessons learned from from that. I think it was probably helicopter when when they had the whole Iran. <laughs> but whatever. But but it's a great it's a great it's a a great uh, metaphor. And yeah, I'll add to that. I mean, it's important to have a lofty goal, whatever it is. It might be the U.S. Math Olympiad now. Later in life, it might be to do something else. And 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 almost like uncomfortably lofty is great. Uh, but but know why you're doing it. You know what what is the motivation for it? Is it is it your identity? Is it your pride? Uh, which, you know, aren't the best motivations. I, and I'm guilty of sometimes that motivating me, uh, or is it some, you know, deeper motivation, which is tends to be better ones. Uh, but then how do you put to Richard's point, one foot in front of the next to just move in that direction. You don't always know you're even moving in that direction because there's like a top of the mountain that there's fog in between. But I love Richard's metaphor of just, you know, one problem at a time, one step at a time. And you would be, I always say, I'll say another thing. You'd be shocked how many people, I grew up with, you know, math competitions in college where I would look and I'm like, wow, they, they might be smarter than me. Um, and, but they kind of gave up sometimes on their lofty admissions <laughs> and, I, and I, and myself, and I'm, I'll put Richard in that. We, we kind of didn't give up. We're kind of like, well, maybe, maybe, but I'm just going to keep trying and I'm going to keep putting one foot in front. I'm going to keep putting myself in uncomfortable situations. I'm going to keep putting myself out of my comfort zone, stretching myself. And you really know, don't know how far you're going to be able to get. So what are those ambitions for you, Sal? My, my ambitions? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, there's a theory uh, that I've sometimes circulated. I'm guilty of, 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 uh, of, of spreading uh, that 
you know, there's been so much in my life that I feel, and obviously I, I, I'm a student of statistics, so I understand how statistics work. And, you know, if you have a room full of people and one person flips eight times, in a, you know, a, someone's going to flip eight times in a row in a room of 256 people or likely to, um, but that person's going to think that they're blessed in some way, right? It's just, a, it's, even though someone's going to flip it. Um, and so, I, you know, I've had so many things that feel like blessings in my life that I, I sometimes feel that, but because of that, I have this theory that benevolent aliens are leveraging Khan Academy to prepare humanity for first contact. So that's my lofty ambition is how do we prepare humanity for first contact? Because I would like to, if they are benevolent or reasonably <laughs> benevolent, um, you know, as long as I still am relevant, I would like, I would like to be, no, no, but, but in all seriousness, whether or not they're benevolent aliens, um, I, I, you know, if, 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 if by the time, you know, I'm done with this body, so to speak, I can, you know, uh, many millions or billions of folks can say that they were able to find meaning and purpose in life, tap into their potential and help accelerate human progress. Uh, you know, and, and, and the whole while I'm having fun doing it, yeah. that's my dream scenario. I don't know yours. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think you captured it really well. The, the, helping people realize their potential. Like to me, the, the, the thing that keeps me up at night is what is a concern that we are not reaching our potential um, in education, in art of problem solving, personal potential, and working with the set of students that we work with, like that's the goal is to help them be able to realize their potential because these kids have such amazing, amazing potentials. And it would be uh, when those aliens come, whether they're benevolent or not, we want, <laughs> if they're not benevolent, we really need to be prepared. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and so many of the kids we work with have, have so much to offer. So when, when people will say, hey, you could have gone into research, I'm like, I, and I couldn't do a small fraction of what my students are gonna be able to do. I'm quite happy with where we are now. Yeah, we agree. Let's see the next question from, from Anikath, if you wanna ask your question. I don't see an Anikath in the, in the Zoom name. Okay. Well, I, well, just I can ask, oh, I'll I just do. ask. No, just go ask, ahead. I'll just ask the question then. Do either, they're asking, do, do, do we know how to solve a Rubik's Cube? Do you, Richard? <laughs> Not without a lot of help. <laughs> yeah. Me and my son, my son who is now, uh, t just turned 12 years old, but when he was five years old, he wanted to learn. So we sat down for a week. He learned before I did. I spent most of the weekend, my best time, because this is apparently something people measure, was like four minutes <laughs> for solving a Rubik's Cube. I can't do it right. I mean, I've, I've forgotten some of the things. My son is, um, his best time is, I think, like nine seconds. Uh, so he's starting to get into like, I know, you know, the, the world-class territory is like six, seven seconds. So um, he's he's into it. Let's just, <laughs> let's just, let's just say it. <laughs> That's terrifying. The son surpasses the father. That's what every, yeah, uh, once you get over your own ego bruises, you're happy about that. Do you have yeah, I remember the first time I beat my dad at tennis. So I, I still remember that. So it's a big moment. I, I'm remembering my, my son is just passing me now in chess. And every time my ego gets bruised, I'm like, no, this is your job as a father. That's, you have, he is the better version of you. That's, <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> that's the goal. Okay, this is a good question. So, um, Agraj or Agra J, Agraj, next question. Uh, Agraj, uh, thank you, both of you. Uh, you're uh, it's such an inspiration for me. You do not even know how much difference you've made. So, Sel and Richard, I have a question. Uh, while learning, in the process of learning, sometimes there is a feeling of uh, not being able to good, not being able to think like I'm good enough or I've seen it with my friends as well. So how do we deal with that? And even knowing, even after knowing that we grow, our brains grow when we uh, face a problem. So I'm sorry for if I'm stuttering a bit, but that's the question. No. It makes, makes all the sense in the world. Great question. Richard, you want to take a first stab at that? Uh, I mean, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, this is, this is what learning feels like. And that's one of the things I always I have to remind myself is when I get really frustrated with something I can't do or something I'm trying to, to master like that, 
the, the doubt creeps in, the frustration creeps in, maybe a little bit of anger mixed in there or, or definitely a lot of self-doubt. Um, stepping back a little bit and being a little meta about it and being like, oh, I recognize this feeling. This is where the good stuff is actually happening. I'm actually engaging and trying to figure out something that don't always get there. But if you never feel like that, you're not learning. You're not being, you're not being, you're not challenging yourself enough. You're not getting out to the frontiers of what you're capable of doing. So um, trying to get a little bit of emotional and personal distance from that feeling and recognize it as this is a signal that, that you're actually getting, you're getting close, you're getting, you're getting deeply involved in a thing that you really care about. And that's a positive thing, even though it doesn't feel like it at the time. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I mean, what you've described, first of all, recognize everyone has experienced that feeling and continues to experience that to a certain degree. Even some of these people that you look and they, it feels like they have it all figured out. They're ultra confident, sometimes more so than anyone. <laughs> they're, they're feeling, you know, what's sometimes called an imposter syndrome or they're feeling insecure yeah. about where they are. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I think as human beings, especially many people who, who run a little bit more humble, uh, and I'm guessing a lot of y'all are in this, it's very easy to find where the places where other people seem to be better. Uh, and then you don't realize that when you take the portfolio of all of your skills, in some ways you, you are bringing something unique to the, to the, to the, whatever the problem or to the, the situation. I would also say, and this is a journey that I've been going on. I'm still working on uh, because it's so easy to get caught up with ex you, you know, I, I've been reading a lot of, you know, uh, kind of Vedic texts and Buddhist philosophy and the Bhagavad Gita. And, you know, there's a lot about not having, not being focused on external supports, but really just being able to have internal supports. And, you know, obviously most of society, material reality, it's all about external supports. What do people think of you? What is your rank? What is your accolades, your identity and all of these things? Uh, but I think, you know, that's fun. Those things are fun, but you have to put them in, a, with, 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 in, in the right place. The main thing is, are you going on a personal journey where you're growing, where you're enjoying yourself and you're able to kind of take out some of those thoughts that are just unproductive? Like, you know, if, if me, if, if there was a, a, you know, I, I'll give you a, I, I, there was this, uh, this, uh, this event where uh, Magnus Carlsen was there, world chess champion, and they picked four people in the room to play Magnus Carlsen and they picked me to be one of them. <laughs> and you can imagine what went through my head. Like, not only am I playing the world chess champion, but I'm doing it in front of other people. And I have like a reputation, like Khan Academy, people kind of think that I know what I'm doing. Like this could all go away when they see how embarrassing I play against Magnus Carlsen. But then I, I said, Sal, okay, chill out. Just one move at a time. Exactly what Richard said. Just do the best move. Don't, don't think about the brain power that is going against you. <laughs> Just think about one move at a time. And it's really funny. I mean, in, in all fairness to Magnus, he played the four of us blindfolded. So... <laughs> <laughs> but but of the four of the four he um i was the last standing and actually i had the advantage in the game for a second uh because he he actually probably misremembered while he was blindfold but like and then and then frankly when he focused all of his brain energy on me i lost my zen i started to panic and then he destroyed me completely <laughs> um so so anyway long story short is richard's advice one one move at a time one step at a time Try to zone all the other stuff out. If you want, I highly recommend meditation. Meditation really helps yeah. you still your mind and just kind of focus on what matters to you versus the rest of the world. Uh, what I just heard was Sal couldn't beat somebody at chess who was blindfolded and playing three other people at the time. That's what I heard. I don't know what the rest of you heard. <laughs> we, we, we might have a, interestingly, uh, we, 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 we might have a rematch soon, which I'm like, should I even try to prepare? Like. <laughs> Like, you know, get some openings under my belt. <laughs> I, mean, I should have my son play. I mean, have a slightly uh, better shot. Um, see, so the next, the next, the next uh, question is from... Tara. Tara's uh, all the way at the top now. Okay, Atara, yes. Hi, hey, so do you remember me? I was in your last session. Um, I said that you would like help me get into like my university at McMaster. So I guess I'm talking to you again. Um, anyways, my question was, um, cause like I'm doing online school, like how do you really like succeed in online school? Cause I find it very hard with like setting it's cause it's like university, like you basically set up your own schedule, like do your work like asynchronously. And like, also how do you, 
help people in online school, like in these specific circumstances? Like, what are some methods for that? I, I'll take a stab at it. And I'd also love Richard's perspective because you you run an online school in a lot of ways. Um, you know, I, I personally have not never been a pure online student um, in my own education, uh, but I have been an autodidact uh, and, and many times where I had to kind of take 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 things on myself um you know my best answer is to really take everyone's different everyone's going to need different types of supports you know you might be able to learn the academic stuff just fine but then you're feeling lonely you need some community you need folks to talk to um you know that's where uh, your online school might have supports there engage with that there might be you know, schoolhouse. We're hoping it create, turns into over time a really rich community where you can be connected with, with a lot of folks and feel a real richness of, of community. Uh, if you know, one thing I've also learned is, and I'm, I was never good at it, so I'm being a little bit of a hypocrite giving this as advice. Is you know, don't, don't hesitate to ask for help. Like if you feel like something isn't working, either on the academic side or on the emotional side tell people about it. You know, if your school has, if your online school has supports, talk to people about it. I'm guessing they'd be more than willing to help you. Um, but obviously then talk to peers or talk to your parents or siblings uh, about, uh, you know, what you need. And, you know, I think the dimensions that most human beings need, uh, you, you need the academic and make sure you can engage in that. Um, if you, and if that's not working, try to find help there. You need friendships and kind of social, uh, you know, you, you can't overinvest in that. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people who are very successful and they're my and Richard's age, but they've kind of lost that and they're feeling a little empty because even though they've succeeded really far in that dimension, they've been missing a little bit of that connection. So look for ways to to, to connect there. And um, yeah, I mean, above and beyond that, yeah, I mean, just to make sure you're not uh, running yourself, redlining yourself and that you're you're really re, re, re-energizing. I don't know, Rick, Richard, any other? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to echo a lot of the same things. The the ability to ask questions wherever you're learning is, is super critical. And, and I also was not very good at it. This is why I struggled so much at the Math Olympiad program, because I asked one question, didn't understand the answer and completely shut down after that. Uh, that was not a good strategy. I would have learned a lot faster if I'd asked, because you can learn a lot. I learn a lot from other people. Um, you know, be very introspective about how you best learn. I learn from books. Uh, so you give me a book, stick me in a corner. I'm, I'm good. I think that's a I think online learning, one of the challenges is having that internal discipline to, to stay on target, to stay on schedule. And that's certainly something we see with some of our students. You know, we have some scheduling tools that, that have helped some of them, but that's one of the one of the big one of the big challenges you have. And I think part of the, the goal you maybe set yourself there is uh, put some structure in the rest of your life and the other pieces can fall fall in place. So go to sleep at the same time every day. Uh, eat at roughly the same time. You know, eat, sleep, and exercise are the three that I try to keep. Keep those three working. If those three work, the other the other things will get a lot easier. So I'd start there. If you're ha- if you're having struggles, you know, the problems might be somewhere else. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll triple down on the the power of habit. The more you can structure, I you know I I am religious about first thing in the morning. I wake up, I make my bed, I do some of my exercises, I meditate for thirty minutes, I take a cold shower that lets me know like it's going to be a good day <laughs> like, i'm ready you could do all that before having coffee <laughs> i do not touch coffee i am wow. i have some like deficiency there's some enzyme most people have that can like process coffee if i i'm not joking if i drink one cut glass of coffee right now i won't sleep tonight and i would have trouble sleeping tomorrow night that's how sensitive i am to caffeine wow but, wow cold shower it's like control alt delete for the brain. You're just like, you walk into the shower, like, yeah, I wonder how that's going to happen. Why did that person say that at the meeting? Turn it on. What? What? Who am I? <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. Okay. So, Do you feel like you tend to like make schedules for your day, like write them down formally? Now my schedule is, you know, I have a schedule. I, you know, other people sometimes create for me, but that's, you know, I, my best days are ones where I have pockets of, it's, there's some structure, but I have pro- pockets of agency. But for me, the structure, I do have a list of things that I want to do every day, which is exactly what Richard said, eat right, sleep right, you know, get the right amount of exercise, throw in a cold shower, some meditation, make sure my bed is made. Those are the type of things that, that, that definitely help me build momentum for the day. And then I also, one thing I've learned is I'm making much more time, making sure my, my kids are growing up fast, making sure I have time for them. 
and we do something that's meaningful every day. We're not just in the same room together. Uh, and also with my, my friends um, that I, I invest in those friendships and, and family. All right, next, next question uh, from Pranav. Another question from Pranav. Uh, hello. So um, my question, yeah. So my question is, what was your reaction to Elon Musk donating five million dollars to Khan Academy? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Richard, what was your reaction? <laughs> uh, I, well, my reaction was, you know, we've got this nonprofit over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, no. Obviously, we. First of all, we. It came out of nowhere. Um, I, I'll tell you, all, uh, well, I have, I have several Elon Musk stories, but in, in, in 2011, uh, there was some event out here in Silicon Valley and uh, it was some dinner and they were giving some, you know, it was called the Churchill Awards and they were giving like the Churchill Award to like you know, innovators and Khan Academy was getting notoriety at that time. So I was one of the people who, who they picked and, and, um, and they said, oh, you know, there's going to be another gentleman we're giving it to. He has this electric car company. I was like, who's that? Elon Musk. <laughs> like, you know, I'm trying to educate the world. What is he doing? <laughs> and, and that was the first time we met. And I was like, oh, this is interesting what he's doing. And then obviously he's gone on a, um, he, he's gone on an incredible uh, trajectory. And then we, we, we reconnected in 2013. Some of y'all have seen that the YouTube video where, where he came to our office and interviewed him. And I, I'm incredibly, you know, anytime that I wonder, like, hey, is it delusional to have these like big dreams, to have these big, I'm like, but look at look at that guy. Like he wants to colonize Mars. He wants to reinvent transportation. He's putting up a constellation of satellites um, and he's kind of doing it. Uh, so I've always viewed him as inspiring uh, on that front. And, and, you know, similarly when I had a chance to interview him and then, you know, we'd kind of lost touch. And then um, all of a sudden uh, at the end of December, we found out. So we we're very happy. Uh, one, obviously that support make, makes a huge difference for Khan Academy's mission, but also, you know, just as a fan of all the work that Elon has done and is likely to do in the future, um, you know, as someone who I consider as a, as a inspiration, uh, you know, it, it's obviously great that he believes in us and that, you know, hopefully we can, we can collaborate in ways going forward. So next question, Sam, Sam rocks nature. Uh, hi, so my question was just a math question. Um, so what is 0 0.000 um, continuing indefinitely and then a one at the end? Is it zero and is it even defined? <laughs> well, I think I have an answer, but- Go ahead, go right ahead. Well, well I mean, my understanding is it would be zero. I mean, if, if 0.9 repeating is one, which it is, then my understanding is this would be zero, but- um, I, I mean, I'm not going to do the rigorous proof here. I'm, I'm curious to do, but but Richard, am I wrong? I don't know how you get the one at the end. <laughs> right? That's right. If it goes on indefinitely. Well, yeah. And and what do you get if you multiply this number by ten? Ah, you still get. <laughs> it, I mean, that's going to get you as close. It's got to be zero if it's anything. But that's still, right. How do you get that one at the end? It's a fun that's question. Right. The, 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 can I can I interject with an answer? If you take one over ten to the power of n. Right, that's like 0 0.1, 0 0.01. So the limit is n approaches infinity. Uh, there we go. Zero. Well played. All well, right. Played. Zero. Back, back, back to you two. Back to you. Okay, very good. Thread. Phone a friend. We did it. <laughs> See, I mean, we, we both used a strategy there. We we, we all got the we same answer. We're, we're all right. Yeah. <laughs> no, Oxy's <Akshay> right. <laughs> he gave the most rigorous. Um, he definitely gave the most rigorous answer. Um, I think I came in third place there. Um, let's see, <laughs> Abhinav. Um, so my question is like, uh, do you prefer math or English like in teaching or in like doing quizzes or anything like that or? Yeah, great question, uh, Richard. I was a reader way before I was, was a math kid and I spend more time reading now than I, than I spend doing math. So um, I certainly spend more time with what you might call English in my recreational time than I do on math. I, I think both is the right answer. Uh, you, you need to be able to reason about the world. You need to be able to communicate about the world. You need to be able to absorb other people's communicating about the world. So I, 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 I'm, I'm going to uh, cop out with both of those. 
Yeah, I, I, I actually, you know, when I was younger, if you asked me when I was 13, I would have said resoundingly math. Um, but I think now uh, I real, you know, as I got into my 20s or 30s, I realized that, you know, I always used to have this kind of elitism about math and science that like it's fundamentally trying to get the structure of the universe and logic and that somehow uh, the humanities are more human constructs. Uh, but, you know, now philosophically, I've kind of come to the point that it's actually at the end of the day, the universe is all going through this filter of the mind. Uh, in fact, we don't even really know there's an objective reality out there. Our mind just tries to convince us <laughs> that there's an objective reality out there. Um, and, and so this notion of, of human experience and how it is, how it's interpreted and expressed and communicated, I find fascinating. I even find fascinating this notion. We, we tend to think, okay, we have thoughts in our brains and then there's other people and they have thoughts in their brains and then we can talk to each other. But the more you think about it, you realize that these thoughts start to really transcend each other's brains, that we're constantly seeding each other and that these, these thoughts aren't just circulating in our head. They're constantly like, you know, we're almost like one big sentience. Um, and so that's why I find, you know, the humanities and communication and how hu human beings have evolved so interesting. You know, the, honestly, one of the reasons I went into the hedge fund industry uh, the flavor of investing we were doing was a combination of, you know, there was an analytical side to it where you had to know your, your accounting and your finance and to some degree your probability and your math. Uh, but you, there's also a human element to it of around human psychology, history, how things fit together um, that mattered a lot. And, and to Richard's point, I, I mean, both of us, we have to communicate at least, you know, the math is important, but <laughs> to be able to communicate it, uh, to write about it. Uh, Richard writes books. I've written a book. Um, and, and obviously be able to communicate orally. It, it's all very important. Let's see. Reva. We, uh, maybe we have time at least for, for one more and then maybe we could, we could. Reva. Hi. Um, I cannot believe my, my question was selected. I'm a huge fan of you too. And I've been hearing your voice, Sal, since I was in third grade and now I'm a senior in high school. And the fact that this platform exists and the fact that I'm able to be here and ask you a question is like the most surreal thing to me. And it's just, it's the item on my bucket list to talk to you. And I'm an aspiring educator. I hope to get into the realm of education. The fact that I get to sit here and express my gratefulness is something I'll never forget. And so thank you for this opportunity. And so, so grateful for both of you. Well, my question for you is as, an, as someone who aspires to be an educator, what advice would you give to someone who aims to cultivate curiosity and a growth mindset in the next generation of leaders? So there's a lot of tracks this could go down. Uh, you know, you could directly become a teacher of some kind, uh, which is, I think, it's the most honorable of professions. So that could be a, a K through 12 teacher. You could, you know, go and go on to become a professor of some kind. Uh, you could do that and or, or you could take a path similar to, to Richard or myself, where you, for whatever reason, go into other, some other domain. But what I always tell young people regardless of what their passion is, and I, and I love education as a passion, is always carve out space to pursue those passions. The reason why Khan Academy exists is that I was able to, um, you know, even though I had a hedge fund job that had a lot of pressure and a lot of work with it, I had, I carved out time to tutor my cousins, to learn how to do that, to learn what was working, not building tools for them. Uh, and then that grew over time. So at some point I could say, hey, maybe this could be what I do for real, uh, you know, with all my time, so to speak. Uh, so it gave me that that optionality, uh, you know, and I, I, I also just echo some things that you've heard earlier today, which is Richard's advice of have a big lofty goal, uh, but take one step at a time, understand the problem, chip away at it, give yourself a lot of experience, you know, tutor on schoolhouse.world. If you tutor a bunch on schoolhouse.world, I think you'll learn, you'll really uh, hone the craft of, of being an educator from even a, a pretty young age. I don't know, Richard? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's a big part of it is, is get in reps, try a lot of different things. Um, you're still quite young. There is no telling what kind of technologies are going to be at your disposal, uh, even in five years when you're coming out of college, much less in 10, 15, 20 years. So just kind of always keeping an eye towards, okay, this is my goal. Is there something out there that's going to allow me to achieve what my goal is? And like, for me, it was the internet was suddenly saying, wait a second, this internet thing I can tie to my, oh, I want to work with kids who are really into this stuff. Uh, I can put these two together and I can get started right now. And, and when you get around to actually having to cultivate or getting to cultivate curiosity in the next generation of leaders, uh, the way you want to do that is show them amazing things. Whatever it is they're interested in, whatever it is you're interested in, show them the most amazing and most mysterious pieces of those things. 
And even if that means they're going to sit in the corner and work on the Colette's conjecture for four hours because they don't know that no one's ever solved it, uh, that's a good thing too. So uh, get out there and, and just try, try a lot of different things. Yeah. And I'll, I'll just double down. There's more tools at all of y'all's disposal than ever before to really get your ideas out there. And what I told myself with my cousins, I had dreams even back then, maybe I could serve many people's cousins, you know, thousands, millions, one day, hundreds of millions. But even if I'm able to help my cousins, that by itself makes it worth it because it makes a huge difference. So when you're happy with the small wins, which it still has pretty big impact, I mean, education, you help one person has huge lifetime consequences. Uh, but then if you keep thinking of how to scale and reach more, so, so on for, I mean, this, I, I could talk forever, but you know, I'm sure other people have other things to do. Um, Richard, any, any closing thoughts? Oh, no, this, I mean, um, my main closing thought is just to encourage everybody to get out there and share your knowledge and Schoolhouse is going to give you a wonderful way to do that. No, uh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just <laughs> underline what Richard just said. You know, this is fun. Uh, you know, I, I agree that this is a, uh, you know, Reva's comment. I, I'm, I'm glad, Reva, you, you enjoy doing this. I really enjoy this too, uh, to be able to connect with all of y'all. And I know Richard does as well. And, uh, you know, I think this is a taste of what we can do on the schoolhouse. You know, schoolhouse, we had a debate. Do we make the mission statement, you know, uh, have learning or teach the world by connecting people to each other, or do we have it connect the world through learning? And we explicitly decided to call it connect the world through learning because oftentimes that connection is almost the most powerful thing, you know? And, and so I'm, I'm hoping that, as Richard said, all of y'all can get benefit from Schoolhouse both as learners and as students. And it's not just academic benefit and, and, and cognitive benefit that you get from it, but you start forming bonds and, 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 and friendships uh, that last a lifetime uh, that, you know, you, you, wherever you live, where you travel to Russia, you're like, hey, I remember that person from Schoolhouse, maybe we can connect and they'll show me around um, or I can have a couch to sleep on. Uh, so we look forward to going on that journey with you. And, and it's a really fun community and the art of problem solving uh, community is one that um, I consider myself a part of uh, and, and my family a part of. So it's, it's an honor to, to have you here, Richard, and I hope we can do things like this in the future. Well, thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Great. Thanks, everyone.